please uh, sit over there and I'll, I'll introduce you. Okay. Great. And uh, as you know, uh, last week, uh, uh, the World Population Report for this year uh, talked, uh, mentioned that India has overtaken China as the world's most populous country. Uh, to talk about this now, we have with us uh, in the center seat, John Wilmoth, the director of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs Population Division, and uh, to his right, Sarah Hertog, the Senior Population Affairs Officer. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As mentioned, based on the latest United Nations estimates and projections of global population, which were launched last year in July, India is projected to overtake China as the world's most populous country during the current month, April of 2023. China's population reached its peak size of 1.4 million in 2022 and has begun to decline. Projections indicate that the size of the Chinese population could drop below 1 billion before the end of the century. In India, by contrast, the population is expected to continue growing for several decades. The main driver of these trends is the fertility level in the two populations. In 2022, China had one of the world's lowest fertility rates, uh, which was 1.2 births per woman on average over a lifetime. India's current fertility rate, which is at 2.0 births per woman, is just below the replacement threshold of 2.1, which is the level required for population stabilization in the long run in the absence of migration. Back around 1970, China and India had nearly identical levels of total fertility, with just under six births per woman over a lifetime. Fertility in China fell sharply to fewer than three births per woman by the end of the 1970s. By contrast, it took three and a half decades for India to experience the same fertility reduction that occurred in China over just seven years during the 1970s. So what are some of the economic and social implications of the population crossover between India and China? Well, the crossover per se may have little importance on its own. What matters is the underlying trends that have produced the crossover. First, for example, the crossover reminds us that the number of older persons is growing rapidly. Between 2023 and 2050, the number of persons aged 65 or over is expected to nearly double in China and to more than double in India. These trends call attention to the challenges of providing social support and protection to growing numbers of older persons. In January, UNDESA released one of its flagship publications, the World Social Report 2023, on the topic of population aging. The report reminded us that preparing for an aging world should start by ensuring that older people can use their expertise and skills in ways that benefit them, as well as the economy and the broader society. Second, the trends that underlie the population crossover are linked to the demographic dividend, which is a boost in economic growth driven by an increase in the size of the working age population as a share of the total. This benefit is time bound, but its duration and intensity vary across countries, depending in particular on the steepness of the fertility decline that they experience. Third, in countries with very low fertility, Policies that support parents and promote gender equality, including within the home, can ease some of the challenges of child rearing, especially for women. Such policies can include the provision of subsidized child care, maternal and paternal leave, and tax credits, among others, which can help parents to manage the competing demands of work and parenthood and enable them to have the number of children they desire. A World Social Summit in 2025, as proposed by the Secretary General, would be an excellent opportunity to address the challenges and opportunities of our aging societies. Dear colleagues, in closing, the trends we are focusing on here today highlight the need for greater intergenerational equity, as, call, as called for by the Secretary General in his report, Our Common Agenda. 
Now is the time to think for the long term and to promote greater solidarity within societies and between generations. Central to this long-term planning are efforts to combat climate change. It is essential that increasing numbers of people and increasing incomes per capita in China, in India, and throughout the world do not undermine efforts to move towards more sustainable consumption and production. To mitigate the most severe impacts of climate change, all countries must urgently transition away from their current over-dependence on fossil fuel energy. And now we would welcome any questions that you may wish to ask. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh uh, so, so, all right, so we'll open up the floor for questions. Uh, yes, Deji. Hi, uh, this is Deji Xu with China Central Television. First, on behalf of the UN Correspondent Association, welcome. Uh, I actually have three questions. The first question I asked um, Ms. Rachel Snow last week um, when we talk about uh, the population of India, uh, she said it's not a projection. Uh, but we know that uh, India has no consensus for, for quite quite some time. So where did this data come from? So is that confirmed or just projected? Um, the second, second question is, uh, when, we talk, when we talk about the, the population, uh, how, how important is, is this issue uh, connecting to, to resource consumptions? Because we know that more people can get more more resource consumptions and also can have an impact on what you just mentioned, climate change and other issues. And third, I just want to know, is there a direct uh, uh, relationship between the increase of population and the economic development? And that's all. Thank you. Do I answer each one as we go? Uh, let me just write this down so I don't forget. Economic development. So to take your first question about is this a projection or not, maybe this is a question of semantics and how people define the term. Uh, but uh, a, 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 the, the technique is essentially a projection uh, from the latest available data to the current point in time. Uh, some people refer to this as now casting, meaning that you're forecasting to the now, to the present time. Um, but it is, it is technically the same thing as a, as a projection, using data from the past to project to the present. It's true that India's most recent census was taken in 2011. They were planning to take another census in 2021, but due to the pandemic, they postponed that uh, until 2024. So yes, it is a projection in terms of the technique that's used to produce the current estimate. Is that correct, Sarah? That is correct. OK. <laughs> Uh, resource consumption and the role of population. Well, as we emphasize in our report published last year on global population growth, um, population growth is one of several factors that drive the increase in consumption. And the more important factor is the rising, is, is rising incomes. Uh, that the rise of income and, and changing choices about what to consume and consumption per capita has increased more than the global population uh, and, and has driven the, the increased consumption across the globe is driven more by individual patterns of consumption uh, rather than the increase of population. However, obviously, increasing population does play a role. But there's not a lot that you can do about it. And so um, there's not a lot that you can do to change the, the global population trend and the increase that we anticipate is going to happen almost certainly. And so the focus needs to be on patterns of consumption uh, and, and what the average person is consuming and uh, how much they're consuming and the types of things that they're consu consuming, in particular the form of energy that they're consuming. Um, the third question on the increase of population and economic development, uh, it's a complicated issue, um, but uh, we, we think that very rapid growth in poor countries uh, serves as a kind of drag on development because it presents additional challenges of how do you increase the infrastructure, how do you grow the school system, find enough teachers to teach the increasing numbers of kids year after year, so that population growth in at least extreme cases can be a, a drag on development. Um, but uh, growth can also be a, a positive force for development when it encourages uh, you know, expansion of uh, uh, the, the economy and so forth. And so it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to say one way or the other that it consistently has a positive or a negative impact. 
One thing that many people have emphasized is the change in the population age structure that occurs in the process of the demographic transition. Uh, because as the fertility rate comes down, that reduces the number of children as a proportion of the total, and it increases the number of people in working ages as a proportion of the total. And so as you have an increased kind of a swelling of the workforce, there's a possibility for more rapid economic growth uh, on a per capita basis, at least um, over the period when the workforce is increasing in size. So it's a complex relationship between population and development, I would say. Do you want to add anything on any of those? Uh, I would just add to the points about uh, estimates versus projections that it's not just for India that we have done a projection or a now cast to arrive at the, at the population of the present day, but also for China as well. The last census in China was more recent, but was uh, dated November 2020. And so we've relied on um, data from uh, vital records and administrative sources surveys in order to estimate the births and deaths that have taken place during that time. and and now cast China's population to the present day as well. Yoshita. Thank you. Uh, Yoshita Singh with Press Trust of India. Uh, you've mentioned, the report mentions that uh, China's population could fall below a billion by the end of the century. Do we have any estimate, as, uh, and India's population will continue to grow, uh, do you have any estimate of by when India's population could stabilize plateau because it, could, it would reach that point. And also on the demographic dividend, uh, can you please talk more about how you see that benefiting India going forward, given that in the foreseeable future it will be the most uh, populous country in the world. How do you see its demographic dividend uh, benefiting it as a whole? Thank you. Well, I'll invite Sarah to answer one or both of those questions, as uh, you wish. I, I, will, um, I will address the question about uh, when we project that India's uh, po population will, will level, level off or, or stabilize. So we um, uh, project a range of plausible outcomes of population trajectory trajectories uh, for the future. Our medium variant, that's our, our, our medium projection, indicates that uh, India's population could stop growing around 2064 and stabilize thereafter. But there is some uncertainty uh, around that projection. And so, so while we, uh, we project that uh, the population of India will be uh, around 1.5 billion at the end of the century uh, in the medium variant, the 95% uncertainty intervals that, that we have um, estimated around that median projection range from a low of 1 billion to a high as, uh, over 2 billion. So, so there's quite a bit of uncertainty over, over what that trajectory ultimately could be. Sure. So that, that's the uncertainty at the end of the century, at you're the saying. End of that the century, it's very large yes. uncertainty. Yeah. Um, about the demographic dividend, uh, I would have to ask Sarah again, at what point will the uh, working age population uh, stop increasing? That's kind of the critical time period is the period in which the working age population is increasing as a proportion of the total. And uh, that continues in India. It reaches a peak, it looks <laughs> like around 2045 or something like that. Roughly, yes. So it's, it's in its period of the so-called demographic dividend in the sense that it's still experiencing an increase in the relative size of the working age population. So this has a positive impact overall on uh, uh, economic growth per capita. But there are many other things also that are important. Uh, it's, it's the size of the workforce that really matters. It's not just the number of people of working age. Uh, so you also have issues of participation in the labor force, uh, and in particular for women who may not have been engaged as much in the labor force uh, as op opportunities open up for them, that also swells the size of the labor force. And as we make adjustments uh, in terms of how we think about uh, what people can do when they reach 60 or 65 or 70 years old, and as those people uh, have opportunities to engage more in the labor force, which we, we try to emphasize in the context of aging populations that it's important to uh, enable people to continue working when they want to. So this also can affect the number of people who are working. So it's not just the number of people in the working age range, but it's also whether they're engaged, and it's also how well educated they are, therefore how productive they are in terms of contributing to the economy. So. The, the demographic change is only one piece of it, and I think sometimes there's a lot is made out of this demographic dividend, but it's really only one piece of the puzzle in terms of uh, what, is, what contributes to um, economic growth and what can help countries to, you know, as, as they're developing, as the fertility rate comes down, as the population growth slows, there is this period when it's, uh, it, it's a good idea for if countries have focused on educating their populations and 
enabling people to participate in the labor force like they should be able to, then you know, that's a period when there's, there's a desire for a rapid growth, a rapid boost in growth so that a country kind of moves toward being more developed in that time period. So certainly it's a critical period for India, but it doesn't depend only on the demography. It depends on many other factors as well. Hi, Arun Lewis from IANS. Uh, I have a question based on your paper. You mentioned that uh, you know the, the differences in fertility rate in India. Uh, for example, you know, uh, you know, outside of the paper, the data shows that for some uh, states it's as low as 1.6, and some as high as uh, three. And your paper, in particular, references Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Could you address the, the reasons for these differences? And secondly. You know, in the 2060s, when you expect the plateauing to take place, could it happen sooner if the other states which have high uh, TFR uh, also uh, manage to make their social improvements that could lower their fertility rates? Thank you. Do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so in, in the world population prospects, the fertility rates that we estimate are project and projector at the national level. We, we don't have any subnational estimates and projections, but we do know from, from uh, the uh, surveys uh, and censuses in, in India uh, across states that there are marked differences in the, in the fertility rate. And that those states, including those that we mentioned in the paper, Kerala and Tamil Nadu, uh, Tamil Nadu who that experienced earlier and more rapid fertility decline are those where there was a, a more concerted investment in education and health and in, in access to reproductive health care, including family planning, and that those, and, and, and also a concerted efforts towards uh, gender equality and empowerment of women, and that that contributed to earlier and faster fertility transition in those states relative to others that, that have higher levels of fertility. Um, so, and the second question, could, could India's plateau be reached earlier if uh, fertility decline were to happen more quickly in, in those states that continue to experience high fertility? Certainly, um, if, if there is an acceleration in fertility decline among high fertility states, then that could potentially contribute to an earlier plateau. And that plateau, I, I guess I, I would say that the projected plateau 2064 to me doesn't seem that so far distant in the future. So, so um, I, you know, I'm not sure how how much it would be accelerated. I, I guess we would have to do an analysis of that. Um, but but certainly a more rapid fertility decline would would contribute to slower population growth in India. Uh, ben. Hi, Ben Schinkemer with the German Press Agency. Um, to be honest, I'm a bit confused because of the uh, report of the UNFPA, I think it was two weeks ago, um, saying that India will surpass China in the summer um, um, with the, as most populous country. And now you come here and say it's actually April. So how can this discrepancy, uh, how, 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 how did that happen? So uh, is it okay if I... Okay, sure, okay. go ahead. Yeah. So the UNFPA report, State of the World's Population, and our population brief rely on the same data set uh, in, in, in order to draw this conclusion. Uh, it's the World Population Prospects, our 2022 revision that was released in July of last year. Uh, that data set includes estimates and projections of population on the 1st of January and the 1st of July of each referenced year. For, and, and I think it's the 1st of July estimates that UNFPA has included among their, among their data package that accompanies the State of the World's Population Report. So they're looking at that 1 July estimate and seeing that uh, the, at, at 1 July 2023, that projection indicates that India has a larger population than that of mainland China. For our policy brief that we've released to you today, we've done some additional work to interpolate the population uh, from between the 1st of January 2023 and the 1st of July 2023 in order to give um, you know, a, more, a more specific indication of, of when that crossover might happen. And, and our interpolation indicates that the, the crossover would happen in April of this year. Okay, but still, that means there are two departments of the, of the UN saying something different about the same subject. Well, I would have to say that's unfortunate if the communication is not clear. Um, it, the, the main point is that it's happening during this year, as far as we know. 
Uh, and uh, there's also a great deal of uncertainty around this estimate. We have to say, I mean, the, the precise timing of when this crossover occurs is not known for sure, and it will never be known. It's, there's, there's uncertainty in, in this type of work, in, this, in the type of data that are used to inform these uh, conclusions. And um, our estimate of the timing of the crossover will probably be revised at future, uh, revision, with future revisions of these data. When, once we obtain the next census from India in 2024, we will certainly go back and redo all of these calculations, and I'm sure the date is going to change. It will not be April 2023. That would be my prediction. Okay, and then I would have a, a question about the importance of migration. I mean, like we have some countries, a lot of countries actually, where their population is declining, and some of them, uh, in some countries, um, uh, they, they are increasing. Um, for the countries, especially in the West, which uh, lose population, how important is migration for them? What kind of function uh, can migration have? Well, migration is currently a major driver of uh, population growth in high-income countries. In fact, I think it's larger than the contribution that comes from the excess of births over deaths in, in high-income countries. And as we move forward over the next few decades, uh, there will be essentially no growth in high-income countries from an excess of births over deaths, and all of the growth will be driven by migration. So uh, migration is a very important factor in high-income countries and some, some specific countries in particular that where the growth is driven currently uh, primarily by migration and in the future we expect exclusively by migration. Sarah, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, just that uh, for, for India and China, the topic of the, of the policy brief today, uh, net international migration is a, is a relatively small proportion of the, of the population size and of, of population change for these two countries at this point in time. Uh, Toshi? Hi, uh, Toshi Naba from Kyoto News. Um, I'm sorry if you already explained, uh, um, but uh, for quick clarification, when you talk about the population of China, uh, do you exclude, uh, does it mean mainland China excluding Macau and uh, Hong Kong, or are you talking about the whole China? Thank you. It is, it is mainland China excluding uh, not including Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, or Macau. Thank you. If there are no further questions, uh, I'd like once more to thank our guests, uh, John Wilmoth and Sarah Hertog. Uh, thank, thanks very much for your uh, informative briefing, and have, have a great afternoon. And uh, for those of you in this room, uh, please uh, stick around. Uh, in the next uh, minute, uh, we expect to have with you uh, uh, Paulina Kubiak, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly.